All right, well, welcome back from the coffee break. Uh, folks are still coming down off the balcony. Uh, for the folks that are uh, in the back, if we could start the next session. Uh, we are running very, very close to on time, which we like to do at the DFR lab. Uh, this next session, uh, as everybody's getting caffeinated, is particularly special for me. Uh, one of the things at the DFR lab is, is the opportunity to actually be at the Atlantic Council. And this is something that, that was not expected. This, uh, the DFR lab started as a project. Uh, and then the Atlantic Council had the opportunity to, or the trust in us to actually uh, allow us to grow this and, and build it into a global initiative. And at this point, we're one of the largest centers at the Atlantic Council. And so what we're gonna do here uh, is invite the president and CEO of the Atlantic Council, Fred Kemp, to the stage momentarily. Uh, what I would say about this session is that it's designed to provide the historical context and the context and the fierce urgency of now to the work that we do at the DFR lab as we're identifying, exposing, and explaining disinformation and really building the community of people around this issue. Uh, I would note that we're not actually inviting Fred to the stage as the president and CEO of the Atlantic Council. Uh, we're inviting him to the stage uh, in his in his other capacity prior to his role now as a journalist and as a historian and author. Uh, what I would also say about this is if this event goes well, or if this session goes well, then we'll absolutely be back here next year. Uh, 360 OS London will continue to be a thing. Uh, and we could not be more excited to have this session. So please help me welcome to the stage, Fred Kemp. I'm really pleased. I always thought that was a hole and I had to not fall into it. We, we discussed this. I mean, we, one of the things was if, if the sessions went very badly, we discussed having it as a trap door. There's a <laughs> cellar below. Uh, I promise you that that's not the case. Uh, we haven't really adopted Nathaniel's session, or what Nathaniel was talking about, adversarial design. If we had designed this session as a, or this event as an adversarial design, then we absolutely would have done that. Uh, I'm going to go straight into questions. Uh, we in this group know what's at stake. What's at stake with democracy? What's at stake with our system? What's at stake with transparency and openness? Uh, because we all work in this in a day-to-day -day spot. At the same time, it feels like we thought democracy was ascendant, and that might not actually be the case. And you have had a first-person perspective on this from the Solidarity Movement specifically covering it in Poland. Uh, I would also note that it, you mentioned offstage that uh, part of that was a misbegotten youth right here in Camden. <laughs> so we definitely want to double down on that. Uh, but your experience covering the Solidarity Movement in Poland and writing historically about moments like Berlin in 1969, uh, how do we go from that, right? The Solidarity Movement in, in uh, support of democracy to now where it feels like democracy is under threat, like it might not actually be inevitable. What happened? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stroll a little bit and just stretch my life. <laughs> uh, so uh, the birth of democracy was in Athens in 508 BC. So the period of Cleisthenes and Pericles. And I did not cover them. <laughs> um, the, uh, I've, I've, I've covered quite a bit, quite a bit of stories. But there was a dormancy of democracy for about 2,000 years. Uh, 1941, uh, Roosevelt uh, is president of the United States. There are only 11 democracies in the world. That's it. And so the notion that we're all taking for granted that democracy is there forever and will be there for the ages is mistaken. And my own feeling, and, and part of what motivates me at the Atlantic Council right now, is uh, democracy is in danger, and it's in danger globally. Uh, we had a high point of democracy in 1993 when, for the first time in history, over half of the countries of the world uh, were democracies, um, and uh, for countries over a million in, in population. Um, in the year 2000, you had 63% of countries, 120 countries, democracies. 
We're now in a democ democracy recession, a democracy deficit. The reason for that, I'm not entirely sure, but you can point to two things that have really set back the popularity of democracies. I think the financial crisis, 2007, 2008, big hit to democracy. The other thing is the success of China. Um, for the past three, three decades, uh, China has doubled GDP each decade. And that's what the U.S. was doing at the height of its powers in the 20th century. So now you've had three decades in a row where China, an authoritarian system, is, is, is doubling um, uh, GDP. And so uh, the other thing, and, and we'll get to the technology part of this, we just assumed for some reason that, um, that the modern technology favored democracies, that the internet by definition was open, a democracy would spread, education would spread, uh, um, prosperity would spread, and thus also democracy. But what we've learned over time is that technology uh, is a tool, uh, and, and itself doesn't have an ethos, uh, and, uh, and that authoritarians are just getting better. Uh, Vladimir Putin learned from the revolutions, the Rose Revolution, the Orange Revolution. Um, he, he, he learned uh, what, how to handle it, what not to do. And the Chinese learned from the Soviet Union. They learned that if they had a very strong capitalist system that was providing the goods for their people, and they had a really great group of technocrats, that they could perpetuate one-party rule. Uh, and so there's also an authoritarian learning curve. We very often talk about the future of democracy, but I think you really have to study the future of autocracy, because autocrats and autocratic systems are delivering the goods better than they had been in their learning. So would you say, every time you show up to a conference or we show up to a conference, uh, there's typically one person that stands up and says, I, I have more of a comment than a question, and it seems like China's ascendant and everything's terrible and democracy is done. It, the question format of that is, is that a self-fulfilling prophecy or is that inevitable? Is democracy done or, or is it up to, it, what can be done to make that not a self-fulfilling prophecy? Well, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm very excited about this um, uh, DFR lab, uh, partly because it has been so successful in what it's doing. But I was moved as a journalist by the Solidarity Movement in Poland. Um, I, I think that as a young journalist, I was sitting in my office in Bonn, Germany, which was then the, the capital of Germany. And my boss, the bureau chief, got all the best jobs. And he, got all the, he wrote cover stories, and I wrote stuff for the back of the magazine. And, and so he was off to the Middle East to interview uh, Anwar Sadat and, and, and Menachem Begin, and it was peace in our time in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, he said, oh, but the chief of correspondence says there's some labor unrest in a shipyard in Gdansk, and if you can get a visa, you know, you can go out and, and cover that. Well, as you know, the Middle East is pretty much stuck where it's been. And, uh, and in Poland, I saw people risk their lives, risk their well-being, risk everything for democracy. Everything. Uh, something that I had taken totally for granted. And, and it really made me... Um, a little bit of a cold warrior. Um, and it made me believe uh, that if we got our act together, the United States with friends and allies, democratic friends and allies in the world, uh, that we could really be a force uh, for good and a force for positive change. And I think we've lost some of that confidence. We've lost some of that high ground. Uh, part of the reason I think we ended up winning the Cold War, uh, no doubt, Deterrence was important, no doubt, that we did the Berlin airlift and, the, and the, the we didn't lose Berlin as a city in, in 1948 from being a piece of the West. The military was important, but without the power of our ideas, without the model, the attractiveness of the Western system and model, uh, there's no way we would have been, would, would have been ascendant. Uh, so, uh, so I think we can get our mojo back. And I think there's, a, um, there's an efficiency to uh, autocratic systems. And, and they've learned so much that they can provide goods for people in a way that the Soviet Union didn't. And they're a pure competitor in the way the Soviet Union wasn't for sure. Uh, but I think if we could get our own ability to learn and self-correct back, then, 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 uh, then, I, then I think we're going to go into a, I think a new generational 
uh, struggle, uh, and it will be a new systemic struggle, uh, but uh, it's by no means certain that democracies will end up on top. There's two threads there that I want to pick up on. One is a technical piece, and one is uh, a question about the Cold War. Uh, first, the technical piece. Offstage, you said that the fax machine, if any of you don't know what a fax machine is, please use the Wi-Fi to Google it. Uh, the fax machine was... Facsimile machine. The facsimile machine uh, was an excellent weapon against communism. Uh, to what extent, A, is that still the case, but flipped? Uh, to what extent does technology aid the other guys at this point? Uh, and then on the Cold War question, uh, are we in a new era of Cold War style, ideological, uh, not combat, but uh, standoff? So for the fax machine, I'm going to stand. <laughs> <laughs> to honor uh, this wonderful machine that was, was uh, pretty revolutionary in its time. Now, the fax machine was not invented to help the Polish underground uh, succeed. Uh, and it wasn't invented to help organize strikes in Poland against an authoritarian government uh, and for, uh, for worker rights and other rights. But that's what it achieved. AI has not been invented. Machine learning, artificial intelligence wasn't invented for China to better track its people or the Uyghurs. Uh, uh, but that's the way it's being used. And so I, I, I frankly don't believe there's ethical or unethical AI. I think there's ethical and eth unethical people, there's ethical and unethical companies, there's ethical and unethical systems. Uh, and so how this all unfolds, it's a tool, and human beings and systems and communities are going to determine how it gets used and what kind of standards and rules are put against it. The facts was this curious thing. And the, the AFL-CIO, by the way, brought a lot of them to Poland to help <laughs> the unions of Poland uh, you know, communicate with each other. So, I, and I learned later that my stories that I wrote for the Wall Street Journal were important for Poland, not because they appeared in the Wall Street Journal, but because they came back into Poland over shortwave through BBC and through Radio Free Europe. And so people would figure out where the strikes were taking place. They would figure out uh, you know, what, what just happened in the Gdansk shipyard, what happened in Krakow, what happened in, in Łódź. They would find that out uh, from their shortwave and from what was being sent by fax machine from place to place. Um, and so, so technology is neutral, and, and then how you use it changes. But, they, but th this is why I get a little bit worried about taking people's anonymity away. You take those people's anonymity away, and they're in jail. Uh, and, and so the same thing that's driving uh, protests, uh, pro-democracy protests, I would call them, in Hong Kong, uh, is the technology that's also being used by some of the bad guys you're tracking. Uh, so so it, it, it's really an interesting thing to, t to think and talk about, is how do, you, how do you keep the freedoms of people to anonymously communicate in a secure way? Uh, that is the same kind of secure, anonymous way that criminals can use as well. Well, it's a little like uh, Brazil right now, right? Uh, before the elections uh, last year in Brazil, uh, a lot of people said, a platform like WhatsApp is terrible for democracy right now. It's ruining democracy in Brazil. And a lot of those same people right now are saying, well, actually, WhatsApp is pretty great, and if it could be encrypted, that would be, if we could keep the encryption, then that would be wonderful. Yeah. And so there's a double-edged sword with that. It, one of the things that you mentioned as well, though, is a human component. So you mentioned a story about uh, your interpreter when you were covering the solidarity movements yeah. in, in Poland. And to what extent was the human element of not being afraid of the authoritarian government anymore important in facilitating and accelerating that kind of shift? So um, I, I'm glad you introduced me more as a journalist and a writer and an author than a CEO, because I actually consider myself uh, in, my, uh, in, 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 in my basic makeup as a journalist. I, I actually would rather be asking all of you questions, I'd rather be asking you questions, because that's how I learn. Uh, and so I'm not really 100% sure what, what causes uh, an autocratic system to collapse, what makes uh, a, a democratic, peaceful revolution successful. 
But I do know one thing, which is I saw once in, in, I saw in Poland that people uh, were in dissent. You had 10 million members of Solidarity in a country, I think, of 38 million or something. Uh, I may have the, I think that's about right. But the, um, um, or maybe it's 30 million, but anyways, a huge amount of the population. Uh, you had an underground press that, that had a circulation of hundreds of thousands, and they drove around in Polsky Fiats. And the reason it was Polsky Fiats is they would put the newspapers in these Polsky Fiats, and, uh, and there are hundreds of them because it was a car everybody had. And if it got captured by the, the secret police, it would be a few newspapers in one Polsky Fiat. But they couldn't pull over every Polsky Fiat in Poland, and this is the way they were delivering uh, the papers. And so they were very good. My, my interpreter, at the, at the time I first went in to cover Solidarity, uh, my interpreter I had to hire uh, through the government agency. That changed over time, but at that point I had to hire her from the government agency. And uh, in about the third week she was working for me, she said, you know, I'm, I'm feeling really guilty and I need to talk to you about something. I said, well, okay. She said, uh, you probably know this, but I have to report uh, on you at the end of every week on everything that you've done, and I write it up, and, and my guess is it you know, goes into uh, our intelligence agency, and, and, uh, and, um, and I, I want to start writing these with you. <laughs> and I said, okay. And, and, and she said, and the other thing is, um, you know uh, those couple of members, uh, of solidarity that I introduce you to that are working uh, in, the, in the truck factory there and that they're, they're, they're really radicals. I said, yeah. She said, I didn't put that in the report. And, um, uh, and uh, I said, well, I'm glad you didn't. And she said, but I'm doing that more to protect myself because I want to help solidarity, uh, but I also want to keep my job. <laughs> and she said, uh, you need to meet with more government officials because I need to write more about your meeting with government <laughs> officials. And so this, this is dissent. This means the system is cracking. Uh, that someone who is required to write something and send it, I'm a foreigner, she's not going to, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not going to affect her life very much once I leave the country. Um, but yet she, she felt dishonest. She felt and she felt that she wanted to help Solidarity. She felt she didn't be dishonest to me, and she was not fearful of the government. She had lost her fear of the repression of the government. Uh, and, it's, and I think it's why it cracked in Poland, while it really didn't in East Germany, because there, I think, they kept their control, and, and the population wasn't in open revolt, and, and you didn't have dissent. In, in Poland, you really had dissent from the police to the to military to everywhere else because every family had somebody who was a member of Solidarity. So how do we inverse that to today? Mm. Right? How do, we, how do we make sure that the stakes of the system of free and open society, democracy, uh, feel urgent? How do we get buy-in from people in the same way that dissent had buy-in in the Solidarity movement? How do we build a, uh, not a Solidarity movement against something, against something like disinformation, how do we build a solidarity movement in to make this system feel more tangible, more urgent, more necessary, and not just inevitable and like we already have it? Yeah, I, um, uh, to a certain extent, I think you're doing it, uh, but you're not, you may be fighting against disinformation, and that may be motivating a lot of you in the room. Um, and it sounds almost old-fashioned, uh, and, and sometimes people frown on this, to say, I'm fighting for democracy. I'm, 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 a, I'm, I'm an advocate for democracy. Uh, um, but, you know, they, why were they such advocates for democracy in Poland? It's because they knew what lack of freedom was like. They knew what lack of sovereignty was like. And, and what happens, even in Poland now, and, and other countries of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, not even into a full second generation of people under democracy, people are getting cynical. Uh, they're, they're not understanding what they have that needs to be uh, uh, defended in one way or another. So I think, I think we have to openly say how fortunate we are to have the freedoms that we have. Um, if, if you go back again to Athens, it's, it, it's 
Um, it's freedom, free rights, but it's also equal equality of people. Democracy started as equality of people. Now, we're not going to get full equality, but we've got to think a little bit about that because the bigger gaps we have between rich and poor, the easier it's going to be to drive populism, the easier it's going to be to encourage a, 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 an autocrat who, who then steps in and says, well, I can fix this. All these public elected officials aren't getting you anywhere, and I can take care of this. You know, follow me. And so, so I think it is partly recognizing what we have that's worthwhile, but it's also recognizing the ills in the system and taking them on and realizing that it's up to all of us, not, not just to fight uh, um, against disinformation and people trying to destroy our democracy from the outside, but also fighting, taking on what's eating at our democracies from the inside, Get going after corruption. In, in my own country, the, the, the cancer of money in politics and gerrymandering. And so at the Atlantic Council, we always thought of ourselves only as a foreign policy organization. But we've started in our uh, uh, future uh, strategy and risk department, we've started now to take a look at uh, the sustainability of the American political system. We, we're just nibbling at it right now because I, we, we're bipartisan, not Republican, we're not Democrat, we're, 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 we're nonpartisan, bipartisan. But if our democracy isn't working, then what kind of model are we going to be for the rest of the world? And I think that's really what we were during the Cold War. It was, we, 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 were, we were a model, the UK was a model, Western Europe was a model. The people, why did, why did all of Central Eastern Europe want to be a member of the European Union and NATO? It's because it, it was, what, it was th what they aspired to. So we ha I think we have to recapture that, not just by fighting the external enemies, but also taking a look at the internal difficulties and, and taking care of them as well. All right, we're going to go to the audience for a few questions, uh, uh, but after that, we're going to get back to hard, hard, hard questions, and we'll see how, <laughs> we'll see, we'll have a conversation about inequality after that. Uh, uh, questions from the audience, right over here. Mike over here. Hello, thank you so much for that. Um, I think while you might be comfortable asking questions, you're also a natural storyteller as a journalist, <laughs> and you must have some really amazing stories. Um, I'm a student at Oxford. I'm studying Russia and Eastern Europe. Tomorrow I have to sit an exam on the economics of transition from the Soviet Union. The e economics of? Of transition. Uh. So I wondered if you could um, comment on the significance of economic and democratic institutions and the way that these two play off each other. You were just talking about what's eating us from the inside, um, and you've also mentioned China and the success of their model. Uh, so I was wondering if you could speak more about that and how the West um, and the world in general could kind of use economics to augment democracy. Yeah. Um, I... Before you go, I would say that he's an excellent writer as well. If you need a stand-in for, for exams, yeah, uh, so, so I, I deal with some of this. I, I do a, 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 a column every week for CNBC.com, and I have a newsletter called Reflection Points. As a recovering journalist, uh, I don't learn if I'm not forced to write. And so I force myself to write every week as hard as it is to find the time, simply because that's how I, I continue to learn. And I, I, I'm not sure, I, I've never been, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I must say I lean a little bit more realpolitik uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, I, 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 let's, you know, regime change in China, you know, you know let, let's, let's, let's show the strength of our system through our ideals and what we've done. Let's defend ourselves against those trying to, to take, us, take us asunder. Uh, but, you know, let's uh, hope that over time, uh, as the Chinese middle class gets bigger and as people have more wealth, that they're actually going to want to have uh, a, a different role in how they're governed. Right, right now, that's, you know, I think all of us who thought that would be the case are a little surprised that it hasn't happened. And now that it hasn't happened, what is this incredibly rich country with, uh, that could take the commanding heights of the next technological revolution? I mean, it could be that China is the leader in AI. It could be China is the leader, certainly is the leader now in 5G. Uh, and what if it's the leader in quantum computing, genetic engineering, um, 
What does that mean? So I, 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 don't, I don't know what it means, but I think we have to start thinking about that. Economics. Um, the, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to answer the question in the way that you meant it, to, in the way you asked it. But um, uh, we are at the moment uh, on a high in terms of thinking as the United States in terms of how we're using our economic weight, uh, essentially weaponizing the dollar and weaponizing uh, sanctions. And I understand that. I'd rather do that than go to war. Uh, I'd rather squeeze Iran into better behavior. I'd rather you know, squeeze uh, uh, aberrant actors into better behavior. I'm not sure I'd want to slap tariffs on Mexico because of an immigration issue. I, I'm not sure I would have done that. But the more we use those tactics, um, uh, the, uh, the more we're incentivizing other countries to build a parallel financial system. Uh, and I do worry, I do worry we're going to get into parallel systems and that kind of struggle. But this is harder. I mean, the Soviet Union never played the central role in the global economy that China is playing. So most of our major trading partners uh, you know, we're number one, China's number two, or the other way around. And so to say to our major trading partners, you have to decide between us and the Chinese, even if we're right about Huawei, and even if we're right that 5G is a big danger and you shouldn't give up your whole network to a, a, country, a, a company that will have to answer to a state government, for sure. Um, the, uh, are you really going to be able to leverage that and say, you're going to have to choose between the two of us. And, and we may not like how that answer turns out all over the place. So, so I, I think that our, our, our economic strength is crucial to our role in the future. I think that uh, right now we're, um, uh, we're encouraging, I think China's trajectory, I think they'll continue to grow, but I think they're going to have a lot of demographic difficulties. I don't think, I think once they get under 6%, they're going to have more Hong Kong type protests. And how are they going to handle that? They could do it through more nationalism, through more social controls, uh, instead of more democracy. So, so I think there is going to be an economic competition between our two systems. I'm pretty confident that that's a, a one we can win, but I sort of wish we'd quit shooting ourselves in the foot on the way uh, by, uh, by uh, in my view, uh, protectionist uh, approach and, and, uh, and the overuse of tariffs. And I wish that that gave you uh, at least a five-paragraph answer. Uh, another yeah. question Sorry, from this that. side of the room. My question for you as, as we wrap up is you and I have conversations all the time. Well, we'll go with, we'll go with one more uh, from the screen. Projecting forward, to paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld, what are the known knowns and known unknowns regarding threats to democracy? Signed, anonymous. Well, I don't want to speak unkindly about Uncle Donald, but uh, no, I, it's Donald Rumsfeld, not the other one. The, uh, um, boy, I don't know how to answer that one. Let, let me, let me, what, what, what worries me is uh, uh, most of all is uh, that, and let's be, let me talk about the United States right now, but um, is our, losing our competitiveness. And by losing our competitiveness, I don't mean, though I also mean economic competitiveness, innovative competitiveness, uh, but I also mean values competitiveness, I mean system competitiveness, I mean attractiveness of our democracy. So we have to be competitive in all of those ways. If we're competitive in all of those ways, I'm pretty sure we can take on bad guys who are trying to undermine our elections or influence our elections. Um, um, I, I think the, 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 those actors will get more sophisticated. We as a community will have to be more sophisticated in what we're doing against them. I think it's going to get harder and harder. But if underneath it all you have a vibrant, strong, competitive system, uh, then the rest can be handled. If you don't, then the rest gets worse and worse, and you, and you become in, uh, an, even more, uh, an even more appealing target. Uh, secondarily, we can't underestimate that we are, there are 
four, five things, and I'll be quick on this, but I think I want to do this really quickly, telegraphically. The Atlantic Council is convinced that we're a historic inflection point as important as 1919 and 1945. The reason we picked 1919 and 1945 is in 1919, the U.S. made all the wrong decisions. Uh, isolationism, uh, pulling out at the end of a war, the League of Nations was a disaster, uh, millions dead, the Holocaust, World War II. World War II, we get it more right than wrong. We build institutions, we team up with allies and friends around the world. We go from 11 democracies in 1941 to 120 in 2000. Uh, uh, so that's a pretty good period of time. 70 years, best, 70 of the best years uh, that a lot of the world has ever experienced. What have we got now? We've got major power competition, and our rivals are competing more than we are. And so we, can, we have to do what, we, what we're doing inside better, but we have to not underestimate that, that Russia definitely doesn't want us to succeed. And I don't think China is as actively trying to undermine our success, but it does see our weakness uh, and it does see that there's a zero-sum game, in their view, for the rise commanding heights of technology and they're going to go after it. We have to know, we're in competition. So number one, major power, uh, major power competition, hopefully not conflict. Although in a non-kinetic sense, I'd say we're in conflict as well. The second thing is the struggle between autocracy and democracy. Third thing is really huge questions about the role the U.S. is going to play in the world after 70 years of relative certainty that the U.S. was going to be a glue that hell holds together uh, uh, the international system and certainly democracies. Fourth, future of the global system itself. And then fifth, technological change of a sort none of us has seen before, the world has never seen before. And how is it going to influence all that? How is it going to influence work? How is it going to influence politics, populism? Uh, th th we could go into an age that's the greatest progress we've ever seen, educational, medical, everything else. Uh, and it could go in, in another direction. It could be somewhere in between. But human agency is going to shape that. And so I think that's what drives the Atlantic Council is we know we're that historic inflection point. We know we can't do it on our own. That's the reason we try to form these larger communities around the world of like-minded people. But we need to fix ourselves internally. We have to understand that we're in competition. And, and, and we have to believe again in human agency and that can make a historic difference. To go back to what we were to, uh, talking about to begin with, the third question on the board is actually extremely relevant. And so to what are the known and known un, known knowns and known unknowns regarding threats to democracy. But the third one goes back to Poland. And, and so right now you cover, or previously you cover solidarity movements and protests in Poland. Today, I would say that democracy in Poland could be going better. And so that's, that shows the arc of where we're at. And so what can be done in Poland specifically, using Poland as a specific example, uh, that you have uh, the historical context on. What can be done in Poland today specifically? And is it a, a wider example for democracy? So, uh, she didn't mark herself anonymously, so where is Joanna? Uh, do, do you, thank, thank you for your question. Uh, and and what, what is your work? Say it again. Journalist. Journalist. Terrific. So, um, uh, Gazette of, you know Gazette of Aborcha. You, you, Gazette of Aborcha, the newspaper? So Adam Meeknik's a friend of mine, and, 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 and so, uh, and, uh, and I met with him, and Helena, well, he was in jail, Helena Bucheva was running the newspaper, she was doing it underground, I was meeting with her regularly. Uh, and I just want to tell you a story, because I'm going to answer that question, but it's a really important background to this. So, I'm... I'm no longer a reporter. I become editor of the Wall Street Journal Europe. Poland becomes a democracy. Adam Michnik runs Gazette of Aborcia. He then does a business deal with us where he's taking a section of Wall Street Journal information uh, once a week, publishing it in a special section, and paying for it, right? With, 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 uh, uh, with, with I can't remember the words what currency it was. So I go to a press conference in Poland to launch this with Adam. And Adam is one of the great dissidents uh, of the Solidarity Movement. He, I don't know if any of you know about him. He, I think he's still alive, right? 
and, and, he's, and he's, just, he's just amazing. Uh, and Helena is a hero, an unknown hero in, in, in Poland, and, and the Gazette of Aborcia underground uh, newspaper is called something else then, but I think, uh, in any case. So we do a press conference, and Adam stands up and he says, I was in jail, they, they accused me of being in the pockets of Wall Street, finally it's true. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so this was great. When I meet young people from Poland, whether it's in a bar in, 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 in uh, London or Newark or wherever, uh, at a restaurant, or whether it's, uh, it's a, a, a young PhD student in uh, wherever, I say, it's because of the courage of your country, it's because of the courage of your people that Germany was unified, that the Soviet Union collapsed. Without the Polish Pope, none of this happens. Without the, Pol without the Polish people, none of this happens. That's where it started, and then it just caught fire. Uh, and what really irks me and hurts me is Poland has not, you know, we Americans celebrate ourselves probably more than we should. You know, uh, uh, although we have done the world a lot of good, we've done some, some things that haven't been perfect either. But the Poles got to celebrate. The fact that this government cannot celebrate the solidarity movement in Lech Wałęsa is really a shame. Uh, and, uh, and because it really did change the world. And, and my guess is over time that will change. My guess is over time um, the myth, we, we have an American myth that we really believe in. And it really helps us fight for democracy and freedom because that was the cauldron in which we grew up. It's the cauldron in which Poland has grown up. And so I just want Poland to go back to that. I'm, I'm less, we, we, we do some interesting and good work with this Polish government. And, uh, and, um, and, and it was democratically elected. You do have institutions that are fighting for their way. Um, uh, I have quite a bit more faith uh, in Polish democracy than some of my, my Polish friends have. I may be proven wrong, but I see even now if you see the ferment that's going on in Poland and the, f the fight the government is going to have in the coming elections, and, and they've lost recently in a couple of elections. Uh, but, you know, I, 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 I may be naive, I, this may be wishful thinking, but I actually, I actually think Poland's democracy is going to be okay. And I think it's going to be okay because people in Poland are still willing to fight. Uh, I'm not as confident in some other uh, parts of the world where, you know, you've seen in the last decade, one out of six democracies either disappear or become significantly weaker. And, and I actually think, I actually think Poland's going to come back. Um, uh, and I actually think that the, you know, even within the government, even within the ruling party, there are also different strains fighting with each other. It's, 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 it's actually a pretty, I, I, I we can argue later, but I still think it's a robust democracy. Thank you for these words, and it's really amazing that you see, thing, see things that even Polish people don't see. So maybe it's time to back uh, to Poland, feel invited. <laughs> and Michnik is the head of Gazeta Wyborcza now. 20 second last question, which is to say, this room of people is either looking for leads, looking for tips, chasing down cases, and as someone who has given advice to not only me, but a number of folks that are doing that work, what would your bottom line advice to this group be when they're chasing down cases and fighting uh, disinformation? Um, the, the, the Wall Street Journal, uh, I worked there for 25 years, um, and some of the leaders of the best news organizations of the U.S. came out of the Wall Street Journal and then went elsewhere. It's one of the greatest breeding grounds of journalists I've ever seen. And it's because the editors are so good. And it's because the standards, the, you know, no negative anonymous quotes, always two sources. And it can't be two sources that are closely where You have to be serious about the two sources. Now, if you have, uh, in your case, all of you, you may have uh, uh, a tweet. You know, but you, but, you know, if you have a source, and, and it's a document, uh, you don't need a second source, it's a document, you better check that that document is the right document. I think what I, I, what I would say is 
what scares me most in journalism right now, and, and what I love about what many of you in this room are doing, is it's really become punditry, and it's really become people arguing ideological sides rather than ferreting out facts. And uh, fact gathering is expensive. And a lot of the organizations that have been uh, best at fact gathering uh, have reduced their staffs, uh, have turned more to the cheapness of punditry, and of course, page views don't go to people who gather facts. Page views go to people who alarm you with with things that they might say. And so, I wouldn't get too I wouldn't get too carried away with how many page views so what you're writing is. I, I I think it's really introducing important new facts into the bloodstream, and then ferreting out things that aren't factual, which is what you do. But I think it's both. And so, because you're 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 ferreting out the unfactual, which is right, but then the factual is where did it come from? What's the purpose for it to be out there? So beyond that, you know, helping us understand the world we're in. So I think it's fact gathering, checking them. Uh, and the other thing, there are two kinds of journalists. There's, uh, I think, relationship journalists and they're gotcha journalists. I was always a relationship journalist. And a gotcha journalist is, look, sometimes you just got to do gotcha because somebody's done something so awful and you've gathered it and you go out with it. But relationship means you really get to know that intelligence officer and, and, and the document comes to you because this person trusts you to use it in the right way and to, and to take care of confidentiality. So get to know sources over time. Uh, make sure you're, they're not using you for the wrong reasons, but realize that, uh, that the, some of the best stories in the world are given through anonymous sources who think something's going wrong and they want to get it out to somebody. And so I, so I would say relationship journalism is do, do win people's trust, gather facts, uh, we're all tempted a little bit by punditry in our, our day and age and opinion, is, but to the extent possible, present both sides of the story, think out the arguments, and, and, and you know, we, without facts as a society, we can't operate. And so that, I really, really fear that the fact gatherers are, are going away. Fred, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.